Hey everyone, welcome to another video. Today we're going to talk about issue number 3 of X-Men Forever, written by Kieran Gillen. But before we dive into the story, I want to ask you a favor. If you enjoy this video, please leave a like and a comment to help the channel grow. So with that said, this issue opens with Cypher waking up in a dark place. Because ever since the Immortal X-Men issue number 13, Cypher was whisked away by his friend and put into a deep sleep. So when Cypher awoke, the first thing he asked was what did he miss? So with the question out there, his friend answered by apologizing and continued to express that he sensed the change of the season and the fall was upon them. So because of Krakoa's close connection with Cypher, the island knew it had to keep him safe. So with that explained, Krakoa then went on to tell Cypher about the gala and the hell that followed. It told him that they have been on the run and it also has been ripped to pieces. And while it explained, Cypher heard the pain and the crackling of the bark and confronted it with the lightest vibrations of his fingertips. Krakoa then goes on to tell Cypher that everything is okay now because they are home. And because of that, Krakoa is ready to let him out. And once Cypher was out, he was met by the forces of Krakoa battling against the Sentinels. So with the mutants battling back against the artificial intelligence, we jump over to the Shaw Industries where we see Sebastian being followed by his assistant. And as he was walking, he was pretty much trying to reach out to Emma by any means necessary, mainly by trying to get on her nerves by throwing suggestive thoughts her way. And once he got her attention, he made sure to inform her that he believed that his assistant was planted by the artificial intelligence branch of Orcus. And that wasn't it, because he also believed that she may have been upgraded so she might be able to detect mutant interference. But before he could finish his statement, the assistant immediately sprung into action and went on the attack as it detected telepathic contact. So with Shaw outed, he goes on to tell Emma that he has paid a cohort of hackers to leave some back doors open in the Sentinel's programming that was left guarding Krakoa. And all they need to access it is a single binary phrase that he is thinking at that very moment. So as Sebastian just nearly avoided that explosion, he started to run as he urged Emma to pass the binary code along to Cypher to cause some trouble. So with the code dropped, we jumped back over to the island with Sinister handing out weapons to every single mutant that was able to fight. And while he was doing that, Destiny let him know that since she is back in the main timeline, she is now able to use her ability to see the future again. But the very first thing she witnessed was how there was no way for them to win. Now this right here sparked Exodus to tell her to be quiet because she is a member of the council and he would destroy her if she voiced such defeatism again. Now this is a big deal because as a member of the council whatever she say holds a level of weight so there would be a large possibility that other mutants would also fall into despair if they heard what she felt. So with that stated, Cypher rejoins the battle and immediately goes in and releases the code given to him by Shaw. Now the first time around the code did not work. And the reason behind that was because Cypher was a little rusty after being asleep for so long. So after the second time trying Shaw's code, the Sentinels immediately began to shut down. So with the artificial intelligence's Sentinels out of commission, Exodus alongside the rest of the X-Men started to clean up the remains of their robotic opponents. Now, while that was going on, Doug tells Destiny that they have a chance of winning this war. But that is when she corrects him by saying battles are not wars. So with Shaw's point made and the Sentinels defeated, Sebastian then goes on to tell Emma if he was to die, then Emma would find that Krakoa ownership would pass on to her, assuming that they would win. Because from his perspective someone had to keep hold of the country for safekeeping. And on a side note, he couldn't believe that she trusted Fisk with the money over him. And good luck on getting that back. So with all that out there, Emma then goes on to ask if he really betrayed them, in which he corrects her by saying yes. Shaw did indeed betray them, but as a good businessman, he knows when to keep his options open. And with that statement, he takes out a syringe, which is presumably used to allow him to regain his mutant abilities. So after the injection into his neck, Shaw turned around and proceeded to battle the robotic sentinel at the door. So with Sebastian Shaw regaining his mutant ability, we jump over to the white hot room with Hope chasing the phoenix. So as Hope chases the Phoenix, she states that Rachel's plan to stop Jean isn't going as expected because they're not even at the Phoenix need more fuel stage yet. So, if she is going to hunt down the Phoenix, then she needs something that packs a bit more of a punch than a 9mm. So because of that, Hope needs to send a message home. So as Hope is doing that, Jean tells Hope to hurry up because she was in so many places before the pyre. Now with every inch of Jean engulfed in flames, Jean goes on to say that she burns and sees everything. 
And as for the phoenix, it is running in fear. So with things getting out of hand, Hope calls for the mutants to listen and copy her as she starts to knock Morse code on Krakoa. Now as intended, the message was able to exit the White Hot Room and reach Cypher. So with the SOS successfully delivered, Rachel immediately calls out for Manifold, and just like that, he arrives on the scene. So with no time to explain, Rachel asks Manifold to help her return back to the White Hot Room in order to help Hope. Now with that out there, Destiny made sure to make a request of her own, and that was for Manifold to also bring Nightcrawler to her for a special reason. So as the portal opened, Kirk stepped through only to be followed by Mystique wielding two weapons with anger in her eyes. And with little to no warning, Raven opened fire and shot at the person she loved the most. So as the bullets poured into Destiny's direction, Mystique lets Irene know that she saw the book where she wrote everything down. So as things started to heat up, Kurt Banff into action and unarmed his mother to buy Destiny some time to explain herself. Now with the window open, Destiny goes on to explain everything by saying that before her visions only extended to Krakoa and not much further. But once Destiny was brought back to life, she was bombarded with a second set of visions, and in those visions, she saw a timeline where they uncovered the truth. Because in the past, they had their memories erased of Nightcrawler's birth. So with that said, the reason why they blocked those memories was because Destiny's main purpose in making the baby was to stop Azazel. Now Raven couldn't live with the thought of using her kid as a weapon. So to save their love, they went to Charles to forget. But now with the memories back, Raven was not happy with her lover to the point of trying to kill her. Now with that explained, Destiny goes on to say if they didn't give Nightcrawler up and allow him to become an X-Men, then Azazel would have most likely killed him. So in order to save him, they had to give him up. So with everything broken down, Raven asked the most important question, which was, why didn't Destiny tell her as soon as she discovered the truth? In which Destiny goes on to say, that there is a threat outside of time and space that has hunted her for a century, and if she was to reveal any of her new visions, then that would hint at what timeline she has seen. And that would also bring Raven to the Dominion's attention. But Destiny also made sure that if the worst came to pass in the end, she would have allowed Raven to know. For that was the purpose of her last will and testament. Now with all that established, everyone now knows the truth. So with that explanation, Destiny goes on to tell Kirk that she is sorry for his life. And she chose it, but it wasn't the one that she wished for anyone. So with that sorry out there, Nightcrawler hugs his mother and tells her his feelings for her may be complicated, but they could try to work everything out. But see, that is when Destiny hit Kurt with a bombshell by saying she doesn't love him. And she has no maternal feelings towards him whatsoever because a part of her agreement with Charles was for him to lock away her feelings toward him. So because of that, she had to hide Kurt from herself. So with Charles's side blockers explained. We also learn that Charles also promised to clear it when they wanted him to, but unfortunately, he is in the hands of the enemy. So with everything broken down, Mystique was ready to go to war and find Charles and force him to undo his blockers. But that is when Destiny once again put a roadblock in Raven's way by refusing to tell her Charles' location. Because if Raven was to confront Charles then the chances of her dying would be extremely high. So with that out there, Irene compares the future to a minefield and she didn't want Raven nowhere near it. Now this pissed off Mystique because she was tired of hearing Destiny talk about everything she was afraid of. And on a side note, this is when an event from the Sins of Sinister story played out as it did in that timeline. Because Mystique goes on to say that this is enough, because Irene wants her to live, but if her love is a cage, then she cannot live inside of it. So with that statement, Mystique turns around and walks away, saying she will find him without her. And she'll fight for them even if Destiny has surrendered. Now following that statement, we see Exodus telling Kurt that he is sorry for everything, but they are needed in the arbor right now. And once they get there, we see how all of them are talking about their next move. Because what they need to do is get Nightcrawler's Hope Sword to Hope. But the only problem is, that Nightcrawler isn't powerful enough to withstand the journey. So in order to pull it off, Nightcrawler hand his hope sword over to Exodus and on a side note, I like how Kirk states that handing his hope over to another person is the purest form of hope. So anyway with that out there, we see Exodus make that journey with the blade in hand until he came face to face with hope. And during their interaction, Exodus is begging for hope to allow him to make the journey, to allow him to sacrifice himself in order to bring the phoenix into existence. But see hope was not about to let that happen. Because she replies by saying during this whole Krakoan era, Exodus has seen her as the Messiah. 
And now, when it's actually time for her to live up to that title, Exodus wants her to turn back and allow him to take her place. So, as Hope dashed back towards the White Hot Room, she tells Exodus to tell her dad he was always there for her, and he was always her dad. So in a touching scene, we see Cable pulling up as Hope states she knew he would come to say goodbye, and she also loves him. Now, with everything in place, Hope immediately looked down at the sword and asked if the blade was alive. In which it responds by saying, it couldn't get anything past her, for this blade was not only revealed to be alive, but also revealed to be none other than David Holler aka Legion. So with Legion revealed, he decided to make himself a little more comfortable for Hope by transforming himself as well as her clothes into something more suitable for Hope to wear. So with Hope facing down the Phoenix, Jean tells Hope that the Phoenix is going to be hard to find, because she'd rather lose herself than to die here. But no matter what, Jean states she would do all she could to help in any way possible. But at the same time, Jean also stresses that she is floating outside of space and time, so with that going on she could only lead her and watch out for any potential trouble, but as for all the heavy lifting, that would unfortunately fall on Hope's shoulders alone. So with that explained, Hope sets off with the Hope Sword, or better yet Legion's abilities, as she hunts down the evasive Phoenix Force. Now following that, this issue ends with a dialogue from Enigma saying, he learned the truth from Mother Righteous. He learned that Hope was playing the role of the Great Hunter, and the prey she was looking for was the only thing that threatened him the most, and to make things worse for him, all this was taking place in a location that he could not travel to. So to right this wrong, we jump over to Anchorage, Alaska nine months before the birth of Hope at a small diner. And when we get there, we see a man asking a woman about her future pregnancy, we see Enigma plotting on Hope. So with that said, this issue comes to an end. But anyway, down in the comment section below, let me know your thoughts about this issue and what predictions you could have moving forward. So with that established, I hope you enjoyed this video and please don't forget to leave a like and a comment if you want to see more videos like this. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Enigma